Hello everyone. I expect because I'm holding this large book in an armchair, you're going to think I'm going to tell you a story. Well, you're right. Here's one about the unluckiest princess in the world. She was a beautiful princess and she had met the most handsome prince there had ever been. She loved him and she knew she would never love anyone else. So they got married and on her wedding day they kissed for the first time. Unfortunately, the prince turned into a frog. Hmm. That one's finished a bit earlier than I expected. Um, what now? Ah, seeing as we've got a bit of time, why don't I tell you the story of my extraordinary family? They are a bit extraordinary because in one way or another my family have had something to do with every nursery rhyme in the history of the world ever. And that's true. Or my name isn't Grandma. For example, this hat belonged to Great Uncle Joe. Joe was a very special soldier, along with just 9,999 others. That's because he was a soldier in the army of the Duke of York. Now, the Duke was a bit old, but he still liked to do grand things, particularly with his army. So all of his soldiers always wore full uniform with bright red jackets and shiny buttons and big hats and smart boots. All 10,000 of them. Unfortunately for the Duke, there weren't any wars or anything like that at the time, so he and his soldiers didn't really have anything to do. After a few months of practising just standing around, the Duke decided that they looked so grand they really should do something. So they marched up and down a hill. That was it. They just marched up and down. Well, it may not have been one of the bravest things in military history, but it was certainly one of the most silly. Indeed, they got the award for the silliest thing three years running. And I've got two things to show you that remind me of it. The first is this hat. It's so beautiful. I can just imagine Great Uncle Joe wearing it, all strong and handsome underneath its proud brim. So I'll always treasure and keep it exactly as it was to remind me of him. Exactly as it was, except that I've turned it into a lampshade. Good, eh? The second thing I can show you is a picture of the army doing the marching. Joe used to say he was 9,996th from the left, but I always lose count. Ah oh, well. Do you know the nursery rhyme that they wrote about this army? It's the Grand Old Duke of York. Joe wasn't the only person in the army in our family. There was also Mad Uncle Ifor. He designed an enormous cannon for the king's army hundreds of years ago. It was to protect the king's castle and so they put it on the castle wall. It was huge, hard, shiny, threatening metal. It didn't just look scary, it looked like the scariest, biggest, nastiest gun in the whole world. Unfortunately, it was a bit too big. It was a bit too heavy for the wall they stood it on. There was a crack, then a creak, then a crumble, then a crack, and down it fell with an enormous crash. It smashed into lots of little pieces. It was so badly broken that although they rushed out on their horses, the king's men couldn't put the thing back together again. 
Now, you may not realise it, but you've probably heard the story of Mad Uncle i cannon before. That's because the King's enemies made fun of what a failure it was. They called it Humpty Dumpty. object in this cottage reminds me of someone in the family. For example, down here is something that reminds me of old Hopalong Harry. He was known as Hopalong because he had a wooden leg. And here it is. Hmm. Even this fruit bowl with these oranges and lemons reminds me of someone. A long time ago, London was a busy port. Sailors would bring boats up the river loaded down with fruit and vegetables and bottles of drink and live animals and fine clothes and, well, everything you can imagine from all over the world. One of those sailors was a member of our family. His name was Longshoreman London Larry. Sailing up the River Thames through the heart of London, the sailors would hear the bells ring on all the London churches. As one lot rang after another, it must have sounded as if the bells were talking to each other. So the sailors made up a song, pretending that that's just what the bells were doing and about what they might be saying if they were talking about the shipping trade. person who worked for royalty in our family was great 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 Aunt Maud. She was a cook and very keen to please the king. One day as she'd run out of gravy she put some chocolate sauce with the roast beef. She was a bit worried that the king might not like it but he did. Maud noticed that the queen had slipped off to eat some bread and honey somewhere else but the king told Maud she should try new things more often. So, the next day she made a meat pie with some rice and peas and spices and a small amount of hedge. It wasn't like anything the royal family had ever had before. Is there any more bread and honey? said the Queen. But the King loved it. More new things, he cried. I don't care how expensive they are. I can afford it. I'm king. Well, from then on, Maud tried out more and more new recipes. She got wilder and wilder in her ingredients. 
she invented dish after dish, including one that has survived to this day in our family, duck with a hint of gravel. But the dish that she was most famous for was blackbird pie. Not only was it an extraordinary idea, but the day it was served, it caused a few odd things to happen, as you can hear from the song. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds picked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before a king? The king was in his counting house, counting out his money. The queen was in the parlor, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, hanging out the clothes. When down came a blackbird and pecked off her nose. Hearing the commotion, little Jenny Wren flew down into the garden and popped it on again. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was open, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before a king? I like to keep things neat and tidy in my kitchen. Tea, coffee, gravel. Hmm, must get some more gravel soon. And here's curds and whey. Curds and whey. They always remind me of a great niece called Muffet. She used to love them. I think there was a story about what happened to her. Do you know what it was? Hmm, I can't remember. Oh well. Let me show you some more things in my kitchen. <coughs> This is a small stool known as a tuppet, and this is a spider. Do you know, I've just remembered what that story about my little niece was. In fact, it was put into a song. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuppet, eating her curds and whey. Who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away, away, and frightened Miss Muffet away. Poor little Miss Muffet. I hope when she got home there was some food in the cupboard to make up for losing her curds and whey. But standing here by my cupboard reminds me of another relative, old Mother Hubbard. The story goes that times were hard for old Mother Hubbard. Once, when her faithful dog, Trevor, wanted a bone, he bounced around Mother Hubbard, barking gaily and wagging his tail. She smiled at his happy little face and went to the cupboard to get the little fella something. She got to the cupboard, she opened it, but guess what? It was bare. So, she went to get a bone from somewhere else. But I'm afraid Trevor started to mess around a bit. What? Something in the cupboard? No, 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 the cupboard is bare, look. See, it is bare. Of course, someone wrote a nursery rhyme about the whole incident with the bare cupboard and the tricks that the dog got up to when Mother Hubbard went shopping for him. She went to the cupboard to fetch her poor dog a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog had none. She went to the fruit shop to buy him some fruit. But when she came back, he was playing the flute. She went to the fish shop to buy him some fish. But when she came back, he was. 
was licking the dish. She went to the cobbler's to buy him some shoes. But when she came back, he was reading the news. Now old mother Harper, she went to the cupboard to fetch a poor dog, a poor. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare. And so the poor dog had none. Yes, that part of the family often had a bare cupboard in those days because they had no money. They'd have to borrow a few pennies to eat and if they didn't like the taste of the pennies, they'd spend them on food, like rice or treacle. Of course, if you were poor, it wasn't very easy to borrow money in those days. What people did was take something they owned to a pawnbroker shop. It could be anything, like this old iron. Anyway, the pawnbroker would give them some money for it. When the family were a bit better off, they could go back to the pawnbroker and buy it back off him. This was known as pawning or popping. So, if you pawn the iron, which in those days was known as a weasel, that would be called popping the weasel. When they got some money, the family would want to go and have a good time which might mean going down to the local pub. Our family lived in East London in those days and the most popular pub was always full of people talking, laughing, drinking, singing and having a good time. The pub was called The Eagle on the City Road and this is the song about how they all lived in those days. Whenever I look out of here, I think of a game that children used to play all those years ago. I used to play it too, and my grandchildren play it now. If you look at these roses, can you think what it is? A ring of roses. Yes, it's ring a ring of roses. But here's an odd thing. The song isn't actually about roses at all. Shall I tell you what it's about? It's about a terrible illness called the Great Plague. Now, the Great Plague wasn't called great because it was really good or lots of fun. It was called that because it affected so many people. Everywhere, people became terribly ill. The signs were always the same. Your skin would come out in great red spots and you'd cough and wheeze and sneeze and then you'd die and people carried bunches of herbs called poses around in their pockets to try and keep the disease away. That's where the words of the song come from. It's a happy song because happily the plague was cured a long time ago. So you can sing the song dancing round in a circle. When you get to the ah tissue, pretend that the old plague has risen up and travelled across the centuries to knock you down dead where you stand and fall to the floor. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of poses, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. The king had sent his daughter to fetch a pail of water, a tissue, a tissue, we all bow down. The bird upon the steeple sits high above the people, a tissue, a tissue, we all kneel down. The wedding bells are ringing, the boys and girls are singing. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of poses. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Here's one of the most beautiful members of our family, Barbara of Banbury Cross. She lived hundreds of years ago 
and was quite a sight to see. She rode around on an enormous white horse. She wore the most beautiful clothes and her long black hair waved in the wind. But not only did she look wonderful, she sounded wonderful too because she used to wear little bells on her toes and they would tinkle away wherever she went. Ah yes, she was very famous in the Banbury Cross area. People used to ride for miles to Banbury Cross Market just to see her go by. That's why there's a song about her. Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross To see a fine lady upon a white horse Rings on her fingers and bells on her toes And she shall have music wherever she goes Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross To buy little Johnny a galloping horse it trots behind and it ambles before And Johnny shall ride till he can ride no more Whenever I knit with white wool, I always think of a little shepherd girl in the family who was called Bo Peep. It's a strange tale Little Bo Peep used to look after the family sheep. One year, there were a few sheep who were a bit naughty. They'd call Little Bo Peep names behind her back and pinch her bonnet. Sometimes they pretend not to be sheep at all, barking and going meow, which we all know sheep shouldn't do. Well, this is the story of the day the sheep sneaked off somewhere without telling Little Bo Peep, which is a very naughty thing to do. You'll hear how they felt awful about it later and hung their heads, dragging their tails behind them in shame. Have you ever heard the saying, the black sheep of the family? It means someone who the family is a bit embarrassed about. In our family, it's great uncle Nigel. He likes to wear his socks as a hat. Well, there's a song about a black sheep, but the black sheep in the song turns out to be very nice. He doesn't do anything bad or embarrassing. In fact, he's very polite. He's asked for some wool and says who he's going to give it all to. So. It just goes to show, you shouldn't judge by appearances, should you? paper around this book reminds me of someone in our family, our Jack. What a young lad he was, always tearing around, often with his friend Jill, neither of them ever bothering to look where they were going. What a pair. One day, when they were out fetching water, Jack tripped over an old tree root, went flying through the air and landed on the top of his head, which people sometimes call the crown. Jill was so concerned that she rushed towards him and did exactly the same thing. 
and I think that the bang on the head made Jack even sillier than he was before. Because instead of going to see a doctor, he tried to treat it himself by adding vinegar, then brown paper. I mean, really? Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Up Jack got and home it trot as fast as he could caper. Went to bed and patched his head with vinegar and brown paper. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. As I said earlier, everything in this cottage reminds me of someone, except this. In fact, I've never seen it before. Oh well, that's about all now, and it's time for bed. When we get to this time of the day, I sometimes look out of the window and up at the sky. There's one little star I always see, and I always think that it must have been shining down on us here for thousands and thousands of years. Just think, all my family in all those years gone by have probably looked up at it at some time or another. Amazing, isn't it? And it's still shining on all of us. And it probably will be for some time yet. Good night then. Goodbye. Twinkle